Thank you very much. I would like to thank first the organizer for inviting me. Um, I'm a basic science researcher at Vanderbilt University, but I have a medical background. And um, the focus of my talk today is going to show you how important it is to have optimal glycosylation levels to establish or to determine the right formation of a neuronal synapse. So as it was mentioned throughout the conference, sugars uh, decorate heavily different cell surfaces. And these include also extracellular spaces at the level of the nervous system. So when you get a neuron that is going to interact with either another neuron or a muscle, there's a space between them, but this space is not an empty space. It's actually um, heavily decorated by different mixture of sugars that will determine how that interaction is going to take place and how that interaction is, I mean, how, how the signal is going to be transmitted. So just so I can give you an example, this is a cartoon that will help me uh, that will let you understand what is going on at the level of the synapse. So at the level of the synapse, we have the neuron. And let's think about the neuron as a mouth. So the mouth is going to transmit you a signal, and I want you to get the right signal to the other end. So the signal trans, uh, travels in the form of neurotransmitters, and it needs to be released. But to be able to reach the other end, the other end should act and should behave as the right ear. The ear needs to listen the message in the proper way so it can act and it, it, it then can uh, do the action that it's supposed to do. But the same way that we have, that we are relying on that ear, we also rely on the space between the nerve and the muscle. In this case, just so I give an example, so we rely on having a good tuning system, right? We want a good tuning system in our car, the same way we want a good tuning system here that will be able to modulate how well we hear that message. If we have like a crowded system, we have a lot of sugars, maybe that message is not gonna reach the other end in the proper way, maybe that message is not gonna be interpreted in the right way. And if we also have missing sugars, the same thing can happen. And that's why glycosylated, uh, having the right glycosylation, having the right uh, composition of sugars at this level is crucial to establish the right synapse, in the right, to establish a synapse in the right way, to allow for cell to cell addition properly and also to transmit the signal and for the signal to be interpreted in the right way. Uh, so far we've discussed this that more than 100 CDGs have been identified. And the hallmark of these disorders are basically neurological defects. And so, so far, despite that there's been a lot of research going on, there's not really an overall understanding of what are the cellular and molecular mechanisms that underlie these disorders. So we wanted to, um, use an animal model and see what happened at the level of the synapses. And for this, we are not using a CDG model, but we're using a disease model that actually has shown to have glycosylation defects. Because our interest is to see how uh, modifying glycosylation levels at the synapse will impact behavior and how it does that it will impact synapse structure, if there is an impact from that. So basically, we're focusing on a, galactosem <coughs> on, on a model known as classic galactosemia. As it was mentioned before by Dr. Wolf, we, glycosylation depends a lot on the activated sugars, on the UDP sugar. So we need the proper amount of UDP sugars to be able to um, uh, do the glycosylation in the proper way. In the case of galactosemia, uh, as neonates, we just fed basically milk. And galactose is the main component, is the main sugar in milk. And so when we, um, in, when we ingest milk, it needs to best be first phosphorylated. And then it gets converted to a glucose precursor so that we can use this to generate energy for cell differentiation, for cell proliferation, and so on. But we also need galactose to modify or to supply the right amount of UDP sugars. And we need a proper balance between these four UDP sugars. In the case of classic galactosemia, there is pretty much no activity or very close to zero activity of the second enzyme, which is GALT. And as a consequence of this, you are going to expect that there's going to be a buildup in the intermediate metabolite. So the one, the metabolite that is formed right before the enzyme defect will increase. And also it will increase, uh, increase the levels of galactose and other metabolites will also start accumulating. That have shown so far to also be toxic. But there's no, like CDGs, there's no clear uh, understanding of this disorder. These patients, like CDG patients, also they, uh, have uh, striking neurological problems. The current standard of care for these patients is pretty much to remove galactose from their diet. In some cases they restrict the galactose, in some cases they completely remove it. 
But despite that, and although the neonates like survive to the neonatal phase, the patients develop with time locomotion impairments, tremors, ataxia. 80% of the females cannot have children, and they also have learning disability problems. But one aspect that was also I wanted to highlight is the fact that because of this enzyme uh, not being present or the activity not being the proper one, there's also a shortage in the UDP galactose uh, pools. And that will obviously have an impact on the other UDP sugars because now the balance is lost. So I'm proposing, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to try to convince you today, that the fly uh, is actually a useful model to get insights in into what may be going on at the level of the neurological synapse. So the larva is a very, um, the Drosophila is a very easy to work with animal model. We have a lot of genetic and genomic resources, and we actually established this galactosemia fly model three years ago. And also, the, the additional advantage of Drosophila is that we know how the synapse should look like. So this is how the synapse should look like. It, it's like a branch, two to three branches. And I'm just going to show you, like give you a kind of a sort of a easy interpretation. Why does this look red and why does it look green? Because we sort of uh, uses a series of markers known as an antibody that are going to bind a specific proteins. But what we do is we tag those antibodies with a, like a green marker or with a red marker. And so we know that, for example, here for the green, I'm using a neuronal marker, and for the red, I'm using a muscle marker. So I know that this is the place where the nerve encounters the muscle, and then I can, I can describe this as a button, which is the place where the synapse occurs between the nerve and the muscle. <coughs> so this is how a synapse or a normal synapse looks like. But besides antibody, and this was uh, discussed earlier, we also have similar type of antibodies known as left. The lectins, unlike the antibodies, are not going to bind proteins. The lectins are going to bind sugars. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to identify sugars at the synapse. And here in this image, what you see is that the green represents the protein that identifies the neuron, which is described here as green. But the red is the sugar, and in this case, it's uh, N-acetylglucosamine. Uh, so we can tell from this picture first as that it was a high, a nice neuron described in green, but we also can tell that at the synapse we have sugars. And in this case, it's UDP uh, N-acetyl glucosa. But there are other sugars, these are other lectins, that are not present at the synapse. <coughs> so we want to know whether there are changes uh, in the levels of those sugars in my galactosemia model, and how is the, is the presence or absence of those sugars affecting the behavior of my mutant animal. So basically, um, why Drosophila? And this is a, a constant question uh, every time I go to a conference, except the Drosophila meeting, which obviously. But, um, but here, actually, galactose metabolic pathway is highly conserved in evolution, and it's, it's conserved in fruit flies as well. Um, the galactosemia fly pretty much resembles the patient in a fly. When we fed galactose to our galactosemia flies, they just uh, did not survive. And the same way, if we don't expose galactose to our, to our flies, the flies with time uh, have problems climbing up the virals, they have locomotion impairments, and this seems to be independent of galactose exposure. Oh, I'm sorry. This seems to be independent of galactose exposure, with, um, which um, exa is exactly what happened in patients. So um, when I joined my current lab, they identified the galactosemia gene as a gene, as a glycosylation-related gene that actually affect the synapse formation. So we wanted to go uh, a little bit further and see what happened in animals that were um, devoid of this enzyme and what can modify, uh, what type of behavioral outcome they were showing. So we first wanted to use those lectins and see whether there were, in fact, sugars missing at the level of the neuromuscular junction synapse. So I want to see whether that synapse has the proper levels of sugars or whether they are gone. And that's what we did. Here I'm just going to walk you through my findings, and I hope you can see the, the image as well. But here on the top are actually the controls. So we use the red markers for, to describe the neuron. And you can see here that this is, a neuron. This is the synapse and the, the nerve reaching the muscle. Here in green is a lectin that identifies terminal galactose. So I do have terminal galactose in my synapse. And these are the controls. But if you see here, you have the nice red signal coming from the neuron in my mutant, but there's no, no green signal in the mutant coming from the, 
from the nerve, which tells me that there's actually a depletion of the galactose type of sugar residues at the level of the synapse. But that was not only true for terminal galactose, but it was also true for N-acetylgalactosamine. So I pretty much, the green signal that I was expecting to see here uh, at the level of the nerve, because you can see here you have the red and the green overlapping, which means that that sugar and the neuronal marker are pretty much in the same place. So you have sugars in the synapse. In the case of the mutant, there, are, there is not such a sugar at the synapse, or there's a striking decrease in it which tells me about a shortage of sugars at the level of the synapse in this case. But how is that um, having an impact? Uh, the next thing to look at is if, in fact, glycans are playing a role in synapse formation and in synaptic organization, then I need to look at the synapse and see whether the synapse is looking differently, whether there's a structural differences that can explain or that can be a consequence of such sugar losses. And actually, that's what we found. If you see the top panels, these are normal synapses, two to three branches between 20 to 30 buttons, and they look really nice. But if you look at the bottom ones, there is a completely increase in the branching, more over elaboration, more buttons. So um, it seems that the glycans are playing sort of a regulatory role or an inhibitory role of how much the synapse can grow. It's, it acts sort of as a break to regulate how much my synapse or how many interactions or synaptic uh, interactions I'm gonna establish for that particular uh, synapse. So the next thing obviously I wanna look at is whether those phenotypes are having an impact in the behavior of my animal. And the phenotype we looked at was locomotion just because in galactosemia as well as in CDGs, uh, it's, a very, it's an important symptom that uh, patients have. So in the case of uh, Drosophila, I followed the larva locomotion. And basically, it's a very simple test. You have the larva, and you put it upside down. The normal response of the larva is to upright themselves. And although it sounds really simple, it requires for them to do a coordinated movement, because you have to turn, like when you're, on, you're laying on your bed, and you need to turn around. If you actually think it, it's, it's a complicated movement, because you need to relax certain muscles and contract others. So the same way, I was testing my flies to see how that coordinated movement was working for them. And actually, if you see here, the mutants, which are the two uh, black bars in the middle, are actually taking double the amount of time to roll over compared to the control. So that means that the loss of gout was causing them to take longer to do the coordinated movement. When we put the human gene back to the fly, we actually con relieve the phenotype. So that tells me two things. First, that actually the movement phenotype was because, was because I was losing the galactosemia gene. And the second one is that I could rescue my fly phenotype with a human gene, um, which once again tells me about the conservation and the, the evolutionary conservation of this uh, biochemical pathway. So the next thing I wanted to look at, okay, I have a phenotype, I have changes at my synapse, and I have a behavioral component. So what I can do, and this is just a sort of an example to give you an idea of what we can do from the fly perspective to look at with potential therapeutic targets. In this case, I showed you this pathway before, and we are saying that this enzyme is the affected one in galactosemia. So, long, so what happened if it's because this metabolite is being accumulated and that is having an impact, I wanna test that. So let's see, and we remove this enzyme too, and we create a fly that has no galactokinase, which is the upstream enzyme, and has no gout. I wanna know what happened. So because galactose 1-phosphate should be a, not be a problem anymore. And actually I rescue the phenotype. If you look at this, this is the nerve well described in red in the, con in the controls uh, and the mutants. This is the, the green signal coming from the uh, terminal galactose that are present in the synapse from the control. This is the kinase mutant alone. This is the galactosemia. And actually, this is the double mutant, which we were really surprised to find that we were actually rescuing the, perm the sugar residues that were actually initially absent in, a, in, in the single mutant. And the same happened with N-acetylgalactosamine. The N-acetylgalactosamine that was lost in my galactosemia flies were actually recovered in the double mutant condition. Okay, so I'm recovering my sugar losses. I'm still trying to see what else is recovered. If, if the sugar losses are recovered, then I'm expecting the structure to be recovered. So this over-elaboration, increase in, synaptic in, architectural <laughs> in the architecture of the synapse that I see for the galactosemia fly, 
Now it becomes a much simpler synapse if I remove the other enzyme. Actually, there is, having, there is an impact coming from the accumulation of that metabolite. Uh, we still need to see out what is the exact mechanism, but I'm able to rescue my phenotype in this case. Not only that, but the movement phenotype, the, above, the double the amount of time that the galactosemia gene, uh, flies were, ta were la taking to roll over, is now pretty much looking like control in the double mutant, which once again confirmed that I don't only have a uh, behavioral uh, change, but also a molecular and cellular change that can explain why behavior is being rescued. So, okay, the next thing to look at, we have a galactokinase, but maybe changing our phenotype. The next thing to look at is, if it's really the availability of UDP sugars, then what happens if I remove the next enzyme, the one that is downstream? And again, flies is excellent, are excellent to do that, so we created another double mutant. And what we saw, it was really um, striking because the, the loss that we saw for terminal l galactosamine in the galactosemia flies were actually uh, worse when I created the double mutant. We once again underscore the fact that you need enough UDP sugars or enough activated sugars here, just like Dr. Wolf said, to be able to do proper glycosylation. When I eliminated this other source to provide the amount of UDP sugars, then I worsen my phenotype. Not only that, but I also worsen my structure phenotype. Although my galactosemia flies were over-elaborated, this over-elaboration got even worse when I removed the, the third enzyme or the pimerase enzyme. And behaviorally, while the galactosemia flies were taking double the amount of time, now my double mutant flies were taking four to five the times uh, to roll over compared to the control conditions. So um, this last piece of information, uh, the previous one is already published. This one is about to come out hopefully in the next few months. Um, and we have additional data, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just trying to summarize it in the, um, in the best way so you get the message. And with this, I'm trying to build a model in which I'm proposing to use classical lactosemia as a way to get insights into what, what may, may be going on at the synapse when you have glycosylation defects. Um, once again, bearing in mind that neurological outcomes are a hallmark of uh, have our hallmark of sim symptoms in CDGs. And in this case, just so I wrap up, uh, whenever there's no gal um, galactosemia gene, there's a built-up on toxic metabolites and a sh shortage of UDP sugars that are required for proper glycosylation. And we saw a loss of um, sugars at the level of the synapse um, that causes changes in the structure of our neuronal synapse and that have consequences on their behavior, on their animal's behavior. If we remove galactokinase, we then relief, and we have no longer the accumulation of the phosphorylated galactose. We act, it actually seems that the sugars get, I mean, back into place. We recover the sugars that were initially lost. Uh, the structure now it gets um, more looking like the wild type conditions, and my behavior is also rescue. However, if I eliminate uh, the third enzyme, which provides the proper levels of UDP sugars that are needed for reconciliation, my loss goes even further in terms of sugars at the synapse. My structure gets even more complicated, and that also reflects in the behavior. So with this, I want to wrap up. Uh, I want to thank people in my lab. I want to also thank uh, we, this work has been funded by a grant from the NIH. I also want to thank Genetic Society of America, who funded with me with, for, with a travel award to be able to attend this conference. And with that, uh, thank you. And I'm okay.